to my right, I'd like to introduce you to the Minister of State for EU Relations in Hungary, Judith Varga. And to my left, I'd like to introduce you to the co-founder of the Center of Feminist Foreign Policy, Christina Lutz. My first question to you is the following. How do you see um, the future of global society? Is it a future in which we have more interdependence or we have more national sovereignty? I do hope it is a society which is more and more based on multilateralism. Um, this is what I believe in and my organization stands for. I hope it's going to be a society where people in it dare to be more visionary and think in utopia. In utopia that manages to actually guarantee human rights, women's rights, minority rights to all people, which we have lost over the past months and years to some extent. Oh, that was very brief. Thank you. Minister. I would refer to the outcome of the European elections because this is very symbolic, I guess. Uh, as regards the Hungarian result, the picture is quite clear. Hungarians gave uh, for the Hungarian government a mandate to go on with the Hungarian EU policy, which is based on the concept of strong nations and the alliance of strong nations made, made in the European Union, based on Christian values. But if we go to Europe, uh, we see that uh, voters are searching for new ways. I think Greens are the new socialists and uh, liberals are the clear anti-identical Europeans because they are striving for a European a United Nations or United uh, States of Europe, which is contrary to uh, what the sovereignists uh, are thinking. And uh, I do think that now in Europe we are facing a leadership crisis. At least in one third of the member states there are uh, unstable governments and as a global player Europe may face competitiveness issues. So I think when we are facing China or the US, uh, Europe has to get itself together to face these competition challenges in the world. And it's really interesting because, especially, I completely agree with that point um, about the Oh, by the way, we have to disagree with each other. That's the format. <laughs> right, so okay. if you start agreeing too I'm, much, I'm, I'm going to interrupt <laughs> and ask you to be I was be just more about contrary. to disagree a little bit, though. Good, keep um, going. I like that. So I agree on the international competition, what you mentioned about China and Russia, right? And the interesting thing, because you mentioned the sovereignty of national states, which is a term often referred to by populists, by the right-wingers. We do see and that is exactly those countries that would support them and try to kind of undermine and infiltrate European politics and break them apart. So that is kind of very contradictory, in a sense, what you just said. I do have to disagree here. I, I hope you're enjoying it, that I'm disagreeing. It's a lot because, of fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, quite recently, when I was traveling in Europe, uh, I always faced this kind of criticism, which if we don't follow the European mainstream, which is today, uh, unfortunately, the, the liberal mainstream, pressure, if we are speaking out of the box and not following the mainstream, we are stigmatized, being populist, whoever knows what this word should mean, but if we track back uh, the Latin word, it is being in line with the people, what they want, so it shouldn't be so negative concept, and it's not in any event undermining the European project, it is just being identical with our European values, it is not against Europe, it is for a better Europe. I can help you with the term populist, um, so populist actually means that it is I'm serving the, the population the kind of some easy answers that are in most cases not based on facts. And that's exactly what we see with those that we do call populists. Like if you look at Donald Trump, was it this March that he actually cracked the 10,000 lies mark? Um, like he's lying constantly. One example, the migration pact, for example, like it was a fake news campaign spread all over Europe. Populists were working together, spreading lies about this one. So populist means lying about something to make it more appealing to the population. If uh, you say that it's an easy answer, I, I would uh, say that it's not the easy answer, it's the answer which is in line with what the people want. And those politicians who dare to name the truth, they are actually facing such a harsh criticism and such a big uh, campaign against them, starting from CNN, coming through BBC. And when it comes to disinformation, let me tell you about my recent very bad uh, experience with ZDF and IAD, the, the German uh, television. When they came here, I gave them 90 minute interview. They only used 20 seconds, and I was used in a 40 minute documentary about Hungary, with all the Hollywood effects about the country being in a very, very bad shape, only quoting criticism against everything which is going on, and I was only used for 20 seconds out of my 90 minutes, why I gave the context. So so I think there is a clear disinformation pressure in the Western media about my country, and that's what I'm fighting against. Let me ask you a question if I can. I think 
we can't dispute the facts that we are facing historically high levels of human migration. There are more people on the move on planet Earth than in, in recorded human history. How should small countries deal with this incredible wave of human mobility and migration? We do know that migration is a populist most favorite topic to talk about. And if you, for example, look at Germany, we've seen something very similar over the past months where um, migration and very derogatory terms that use the word crises and waves that dehumanizes those people have dominated national news when in fact what people are really concerned with is how, how they can actually survive, how they're paying the rent, about the health system, about their jobs. Um, so I guess in a way bringing this topic again in here does not represent those actual worries that even the populists care about, but really serves the populist agenda. What we're seeing now, yes, it's some of the highest levels in history, but that's only the beginning. If we look at climate, um, the climate catastrophe. So we expect by 2025, 2030, that hundreds of millions of people will be migrating. And again, it's the populists, the right-wingers, those winning during the European election in Italy and in, in France and Poland and here in Hungary that deny that climate change that will even cause more migration, which then they use to vilify and dehumanize people. Yeah, I mean, great respect, but what's the solution? I mean, you've identified the problem, which I think we all agree upon, but what's the solution in your view? So if you look at how people deal with other people, you have the communitarian and the cosmopolitan approach, obviously, and I guess um, all of you are aware of it. And those communitarians that are more populist and more declined to be in that area, they, they value their own people, their in-group more than others compared to those cosmopolitans. So I believe the first solution needs to be that we stop dehumanizing those people and um, actually look into proper methods, how we make sure that the Mediterranean Sea stops being a graveyard. And that is the very basis. Like, if we want to stop valuing in-group people more than the strangers, um, then we, that's the basis for fair policies based on human rights. Thank you very much for giving uh, the arguments uh, by giving the numbers and the data of the population trends outside of Europe, because this is the growing threat and migration there will you be mean for the, the next 63? decade. Uh, yeah, if you look at the population <laughs> trends outside uh, of yeah. uh, Europe, uh, that's why we say that Europe should stop sending invitation cards to the other parts of the world, and instead of bringing the problem here, uh, may it be caused by uh, climate change or what else, we should bring help where it uh, arises. And that's why we are believing in the development policy. And when it comes to migration, it touches upon the sovereignty, the core value of, and, and the core uh, uh, precious um, essential of a country. So that's why I've always said in migration, we need respect towards each other. Hungary never criticized any other country in the European Union by choosing another path in migration. We actually uh, were criticized by not taking the same mainstream line in migration. We do believe in a different future for Europe because we all see what are the consequences if uncontrolled mass migration is uh, coming and flowing into Europe without any kind of reasonable thinking about the future consequences. This is not against humans. It's based on the future concept of Europe. And if you look at the trends, you should really give a better answer than just bashing the populists. So, if so because you're mentioning numbers, um, I think it's relevant to say that most of the migration di debates there completely inspired and based on pure racism and xenophobia. Look, if you look at Hungary, for example, the numbers are that you have 63 asylum seekers um, on every 100 million people. So the number of asylum seekers here is so comparably low. So there is not the danger that people make it off to be. Thanks to the very straightforward Hungarian migration policy, and we proved that it is, it is possible to stop uh, mass migration on the land, and that's what Italy is approving on the sea. So I don't know what's the problem with this. So, so Minister, um, we do know in previous historical periods in Europe, when nation states have begun to become more important than integration, we've ended up in war. What is the potential danger here for the return of sovereignty? Aren't we not heading towards another period where Europe breaks down again into war, which was the very basis of the creation of the European Union? 
I do very know uh, this kind of narrative. That's why if I'm in Brussels and arguing, I never say strong nations. I always say strong member states. So please do not misunderstand me, uh, because this is the trick when I'm, I'm talking to those who uh, blame me with populism, that it is not based on uh, nations and the meaning which in the end of the 19th century nationalism arose. It is just uh, trying to preserve that kind of framework, what, for example, Hungary and the Central Eastern countries joined in 2004, because in the treaties there are well-defined competencies which belong to the European level, which should remain with the national sovereignty. This is the only thing what we claim here when it comes to migration. We oppose the quota decision. It should have been decided at the government, highest government level, the heads of state level. And when they saw that we will never agree to this, they just changed the laws, contrary to the treaties, by the way. And then they wanted to uh, put pressure on those countries who did not sign up to this decision, which does not belong to EU policies. So I, I wouldn't mix up here historical threats whatsoever. I heard them so many times in Europe, and I think it's not ethical to come up with the past uh, sins, which actually never happened in some parts of Europe. So please uh, don't refer to nationalism. So if I can push you a so little I bit. I don't see any kind of yeah. danger here. So. You don't see any danger of war? Yeah. What, what, what do you, do you think a, a return of national sovereignty in Europe creates the uh, chance of increased conflict? military conflict? So if you look at those countries in Europe where we are facing exactly those problems, we do see increased levels in um, people being um, unhappy with what is happening. People do see the rise of populists um, and nationalists as a um, genuine threat. Then what comes in as well is support from other international countries that we mentioned before. And it also, you know, it doesn't make sense at all when we, when we look at the challenges that we're facing as society at the moment, which is digitalization and, and climate catastrophe and all of these. It's the most unsmart, to be polite, attitude to address exactly these problems because it's not going to help anyone. So coming back to this idea of like national nationalist um, sovereignties, it's, it's not going to help anyone because those problems that we are facing, they're not national ones anymore and they haven't been for a long time. So we will only increase the climate catastrophes, uh, pandemics and all these other problems and no one's really there to, to tackle them. Actually, I had the pleasure to tackle the climate change in my last nine years in the European Parliament. You've tackled it? It's done? Uh, in tackling it, because I had been a special advisor to politicians on environment and climate issues. And I, I, I do know what uh, not only Hungary, but all the European communities are fighting against climate change with a lot of money, a lot of efforts. Uh, so Europe is in the front runner places of uh, as this As long as we change. have Europe, right? Yes, we have Europe on this uh, on a very good path, but don't mix here up. Uh, sovereign decisions, which uh, are just there to uh, gain some respect for those member states who do not want to sign up for this, uh, this kind of uh, mainstream line. And when we joined the European Union, it was not written on the door that if you enter, you have to live in a multicultural society. We are ending up here with a value debate. And it is our sovereign right to believe in a different future. With this decision, we never hurt anyone else. We don't uh, have any uh, bad words about uh, France or other member states who decided to live in a multicultural uh, society. And on top of it, the Hungarian government was brave enough to ask the, mem the Hungarian people about this uh, question, about the future. So I think it's much more honest policy than anyone else. Minister. Um what would you identify as the, the biggest three challenges to uh, a multicultural society? I think the biggest challenge is uh, the challenge what is the Western culture is making uh, for them, that uh, we actually were giving up on our traditions, on our local values, on our identities. So if there is a newcomer, he or she does not know in what kind of culture he or she should be integrated into. And that's why the decision will be much more easier for them to remain with this old culture, so build up in the, his new home his or her previous culture. That's why we are facing the, the creation of the parallel societies, because the European identity is somewhere lost. We just don't value ourselves anymore. We don't value our Christian roots. We don't care who we are. We would like to melt up and solve up in some kind of multiculturalism, and that's how uh, integration is much, much more uh, difficult for those newcomers. And that's how we end up in the parallel society. So I think this is the biggest challenges. And that's what uh, we don't uh, actually recommend Europe to end up with the multicultural society. What would you Why say are the biggest strengths of a multicultural society? Why do you make it a statement that people from different cultures, they are by nature not able to integrate? Like, where does this xenophobic idea in the first place come from? I didn't from? say this. I you, said, you said that. You just said give it. Them. I, I didn't say that. I said we don't show them the possibility because we ourselves, especially in Western Europe, we don't know anymore who we are. 
because there is a such kind of selfishness, individualism, and no uh, values which are based on European values. Are so shown capitalism for this. is the problem then? Sorry? So capitalism, it sounds more like you're talking about capitalism no. being the problem. No, it's Why not capitalism. Why do you make it out multiculturalism? It's, it's multiculturalism, the problem. The problem. And to be a mainstream policy without uh, respecting the, those countries who don't want to sign up to this idea. So this is a clear uh, sovereignty issue. And why should we be bashed for that? So just articulate in your own words, Christina, why you, what are the benefits of multiculturalism to society? Um, first, I'd like to say what are the biggest challenges, because you were talking about challenges as well, and the biggest challenges of those nationalistic and um, right wing chauvin T-ish mindsets. I, I, I should um, refuse these words, sorry, because these are... But it's okay. Not really. um, have a, you'll, you'll have a right, right to reply, you. Minister. Oh, Please yeah. continue. Sorry. Um, so the biggest challenges of this mindset um, definitely is that we see and we have seen um, recently the deterioration of human rights and especially those of minority rights and vilifying um, kind of political minorities in our society. So what happened here in Hungary, for example, that I, coming from Germany, have only been able to observe as an outsider, but then in in Colombia something similar happened like this. As oh one God. example, the uh, um, vilifying the idea of gender ideology, what has happened here as well. And with this one, and then um, bringing in together all these ideas about Christian values and how people are not allowed to have abortions and same-sex couples should not marry and all of these things. So we, so the biggest challenge of of. Orban and Salvini and of all these guys and their governments is the deterioration of basic human rights. So again, Christina, I mean, you, you've identified challenges. If you were to promote the idea of a multicultural society, mm -hmm. how would, what would you say is the benefit of multicultural society? So um, I guess in general, a statement that can be made is that policies are always better the more diverse people are involved in making those policies. So with diversity and more different viewpoints coming into society and them allowing them to participate in our political life that can only make policies stronger, like diverse cultures, like with every more aspect of people knowing something, having experiences, bringing their traditions in, that only adds strength to a society. We all have these diversities in the democracies because democracy is about the differences of opinion. But we are, what we are facing here with multicultural societies is that Europe may end up in a different society than it was 100 years ago. And we are believing in a different future for Europe, as I already said. And uh, congratulations that you dare to come to Hungary after reading so many very, very worse and dreadful mm. things about yeah. my country. I, I wouldn't, surprise, wouldn't be surprised if you were the co-author uh, of the Sargentini report. Actually, I had the <laughs> pleasure to work on the uh, uh, report and uh, the anti-lobbying uh, of the report. You know, all of those who are actually signing up for the report mentioned that they actually are outsiders. They never lived in Hungary. They have no clue. So I would like to recommend you to come here to Hungary to study here, to pay some taxes for a couple of years, have some friends, have some discussions, really feel about Hungarians because we are very, very friendly people. We are not uh, the devils, even those who are working in the government, I might say. So we are quite uh, pro-Europeans. We have the highest number, one of the highest number in Europe when it comes about pro-Europeanship. It's 70 percent. So one of the highest. Mm -hmm. And it, it was actually a rose uh, during Fidesz governments. So I would like to ask you as a lawyer to stick to the facts, to the legal text, and not mm. to believe in political articles and all the ZDF articles, because this is the problem, actually. And you just News actually, you are the, the bad, best example of what I just framed, that uh, those poor Western European guys, the, the, they are brainwashed about Hungary. I lived in Brussels. Every morning I opened up the Le Monde and Le Soir, and I read about these very, very bad things about Salvini, Orban, and, and if the Hungarian government never did anything on that week, they never forget to list at the end of an article about Salvini that, oh, these extremists, these bad guys somewhere in the East. This is the mantra. That's what's going on, and that's what I'm fighting against. I think you got something wrong, um, <laughs> because I have never and would never ever say something about uh, bad about Budapest and um, the society in Budapest. I mentioned the government, and that is something very important. We need to disentangle very often. The people is, does not equal the government in many cases, right? So there's so much more. There's civil society. You have an extremely strong feminist civil yeah, society here, 60, for example. Yeah, 60,000 NGOs. 60,000. They are flourishing, actually. Exactly. So just to correct you, I never said anything bad. I have great friends right. in Hungary. So we're all happy so about I that as well. Um, yeah, just to make that point. So um, in 1956, as you know, as well as anybody, um, Hungary had to undergo a tragic or traumatic experience. 
where thousands of Hungarians were forced to flee from their homes because of the occupying Soviet troops. If you had been Minister of Migration in the United Kingdom, would you have turned the Hungarians away? Oh my God, this is the worst parallel that I ever heard, but I unfortunately hear it everywhere in Europe. Let's be clear what, what we are facing, because that time we were talking about a concrete dictatorship uh, and a concrete neighborhood. So Hungarians actually were fleeing from a uh, pressure from a big imperium. And they were all based on European cultures. They all wanted to integrate. They were all there patiently waiting for the uh, distribution. And uh, this was a completely different situation because this was one very pretty moment in time. Uh, so don't, please don't use this kind of parallel because what we are facing now is a, is a new era wandering of people. And it is not the asylum seeking issue. There are already data that is the big majority of these people are not fleeing from anywhere. They are coming through five or six already safe countries. So is it a human right to, uh, to wake up in the morning and point out a country in the, in the world and say, I have the right to live there better? That's why we do believe in development policy. We have the Hungary Helps program. We help those communities to build up their new homes after ISIS has left, after the war is over. So it's completely different. We are now facing a cultural challenge. This was not the case in 56. So please don't refer this, to this parallel. Um. So I'm honestly a bit tired of constantly seeing certain groups of society, and I would use a word again that you don't like, um, being given the platform to extensively bring in the xenophobic rhetoric about uh, migration. So that is what I mentioned at the beginning that has been dominating German media over the last month as well, whereas these are not the main problems. But it serves again, and if you look at analyses of how the rhetoric of the, the right wing and populists work, that is exactly that media completely accommodates to their agenda setting. So I'm actually not in, in happy which anymore country are you living? Because Pardon? Uh, in which country Germany. do you experience this? I know that you are Germany. in Germany, but because, because my experience about German media is the opposite. What is it? They're actually brainwashing German minds <laughs> about the Hungarian nationalism and uh, all these kind of uh, anti-humanities that's going on. I think what the Hungarian fans actually achieves, it is also safe for the Schengen zone. And we were just protecting the Schengen border, which is an obligation under European laws, which we signed up to when we joined the EU. And for that, we, we became the black sheep. Is it morally correct? Is it also solidarity? We've spent a lot of effort on that. And other countries in Europe are profiting from it, whether they admit it or not. I'm, I'm just genuinely wondering, where does all your negative language regarding the media come from? Because from again, we experience. Again, okay, experience like is one experience, nice little thing, but then if you look at analyses about the use of uh, social media and online media for right-wing and populist means before the European elections and other elections, so those actually dominating this kind of media and bringing in their viewpoints, the biggest profiteurs um, of the media are so actually, of that kind of media, are actually the kind of right wing. And then, I mean, the I guess you're aware, right -wing. I guess, no, Has no, no. Has everybody heard this right wing no. media? No, social mm. media. Social uh, if we talk about the like the right wing so campaigns on, I mean, we know that we have the fact about the, the spreading that? of the, of the um, right wing messaging. Um, definitely with the AFD in Germany, we have the facts, we know who are dominating these kind of um, campaigns Ooh. on social media. Mm -hmm. So, and also, I guess, I mean, you, you must know and you do know that when you're buying into this narrative of fake news, you're completely putting yourself in a corner with the Trumps and Bolsonaros and these dudes of the world. Like, why would you want to do that? I think uh, when we are talking about fake news, it's just about the liberal media, because if you read the Sargentine report, this uh, blatant lies, a full collection of all these lies about my country, and it is picked up by every kind of media in Western Europe, and that's what we are fighting against. And when it comes to the social media, I think if you open up the social media, it's 90% liberal, and, and everybody can say what they want. And you know, when there is a 40-member board, somewhere in Dublin uh, who were actually um, supervising the uh, clarity of all the uh, elections, then who uh, decided on those stuff? Whether they are for liberal thoughts or whether they are for more conservative thoughts, don't you think it's a bit uh, uh, interesting? I think it's not about opinions here, but because we do know the facts about the spreading of populist messaging on social media and the problem that comes with all of that. But what are the populist messages? It Could is you please just give me an example? One example, the migration pact. The migration pact. Yeah, 
perfect example. Although it is just a minority oh, position. Oh, we're talking about migration again. Can we talk about something else? legitimate in Europe, even if it's just a minority position so far, to say that we don't think that migration is a positive phenomenon? No, it's about it legitimate lies. to say? Why, why then you get the criticism that you are populist or whatsoever? Because we know that it's been lies. What, what, what kind of lies? Because you see the trends. You see all those threats and phenomena which lies will be growing. That, for example, that were what mentioned kind of that the migration pact, it's the UN and all those member countries that want to open the doors for a new wave of migrants. Like, we know that it's been complete lies and we know how it started in, with the AFD in Germany and then spread international. Like, these analyses yeah. have all it, been it here. It started f from common sense, from <laughs> rationality. <laughs> and it did not start from any kind of political party. And again, this is a sovereign decision of a member state. So for that minority position, countries should be actually not bashed, but just respected for the different opinions. This is your liberal view, to be open towards any kind of other ideas. Minister, so this is always the Minister, the do, Minister do, do you encourage Hungarians to leave Hungary and migrate abroad? <laughs> no, no. Actually, I also came home, so I, I encourage Hungarians to come home because we are going to be the best place on earth to live. Do you encourage uh, Germans to migrate? Oh, it, it's definitely not, not for me to tell anyone what to do in their lives. Um, so, no, like, whatever makes someone happy. Thank you very much. That was a, a, a wonderful debate. Everybody give our two speakers a huge round of applause for their contribution. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.